I have a question for you. Why Brock? No, seriously, why Brock? Out of all the characters in the game, why was Brock the only one able to see through Odin's disguise? Or more importantly, why did the writers choose Brock to be the one to do this? Because of course it was the writer's choice, and they could have chosen anyone else. Mimir would have made perfect sense. He was a close friend to Tyr and a former close ally of Odin. He knows both of them really well. He should be able to spot the differences. He knows how many manipulative Odin is, he knows how impressive Odin's magical abilities are. Or it could have been Freya, she knows Odin just as well as Mimir does. She knows his mannerisms, his characteristics, his quirks. She could have recognized the telltale signs of Odin's manipulations within Fake Tear's behavior. It could have been Kratos. Kratos is deeply suspicious of others as a rule, because he has already been betrayed like a thousand times before. He never trusts anyone until they prove beyond a doubt that they are trustworthy. He even seems a bit suspicious of Fake Tear sometimes. He's just a couple steps away from realizing that this Tear is obviously, at minimum, an agent working for Odin. And it is obvious. Odin's disguise is very far from perfect. Fake Tyr constantly contradicts himself. He constantly says and does things that Tyr shouldn't say and do. He constantly argues for a path that would only benefit Odin. Sometime I'm going to do a whole video where I just go through every scene with Fake Tyr, and I will point out every single time Odin makes a mistake in this disguise. Because there are like dozens of them, it's literally every time he opens his mouth. But none of these characters, who probably should be able to recognize all these contradictions, are allowed to. It's finally Brock who has to point out that, hey, what this guy is saying does not make sense. Which brings us back to our original question. Why Brock? Why not anyone else? Well, I think there are two reasons why the writers chose Brock for this. A plot reason and a character reason. Firstly, the plot needs Brock to do this. The plot of the game does not work unless Brock is the one who unveils Odin's disguise, because then it gives the writers an excuse to have Odin brutally murder Brock, which is important for a whole slew of other plot reasons. From a story perspective, Brock's death is a very productive one. It propels the story forward in an important way, but we will discuss that in much more depth later in this video. The second reason why the writers chose Brock is because honesty is as essential to his character as deception is to Odin's. Brock is the exact opposite of Odin. Brock's character is all about saying exactly what he thinks without any filter at all. He is brusque, he is a abrasive, he is vulgar, but more than all of that, he is honest. Brock is a character who at all times and in all places cuts through the bullshit, whereas Odin is a character who is nothing but bullshit. Odin is manipulation layered on manipulation on top of manipulation, performance layered on performance on top of performance, deception layered on deception on top of deception. As Mimir puts it, if he tells you snow is white, he's lying. Not because Snow isn't really white, but because even when Odin is being honest, it's all a part of some larger game. He only ever tells the truth to cover up an even bigger lie. From that perspective, thematically, it has to be Brock who cuts through Odin's biggest deception in the game. When these two characters finally come face to face, it is not a confrontation between Brock and Odin, between Dwarf and God, but a confrontation between total honesty and total deceit, and truth must ultimately win in the end. And Brock has to die in that confrontation, because his murder is the only truly honest thing Odin ever does in this story. That's the only time that Odin reveals who he truly is, and in that way it could be argued that it's actually Brock who is the one who destroys Odin, not Sindri. But once again, we'll discuss all of that at the end of this video. For now, I want to watch a few cutscenes together so we can examine how the writers introduced and developed Brock's character, how they made honesty and truth the essence of that character, set him up from the very start to be the character who would unveil Odin's greatest deception. So let's just start at the start. Here is Brock's first scene in the series. 
What you waiting for? Come on already! Let's go! Can't get this slow-eyed cocklump to cross the bridge. It's because she's scared of something in the trees over there. There's what now? You were right. Say, you must be smart or something, boy. You're a boy, aren't you? Ha! Does she have a name? I don't know. Rude bastard ain't ever asked mine, so I ain't ever ask hers. Ah! Ha! What's yours? Brock. Better look on. Say, uh, you're not gonna believe me, but that axe you got, uh, it was me what made her. Me and my brother was one of our best. So don't let nobody else go work on her except for us two. You gotta handle her special, or she'll wreck beyond fixing. I can enhance her for you right now if it so pleases you, son of a bitch. So what say you? You are right. I do not believe you. Come, boy. There's a rune in the shape of a fork under the grip. No, digger beast, ya dumber That was our brand, my brother and me, before we split. I got half of it right here, see? Look, you want I should upgrade her or not? This introduction is completely absurd. Kratos and Atreus have just begun their very serious and somber journey through this wasteland, violent world of ruins and monsters. And then they randomly bump into this blue-skinned dwarf who's hanging out like nothing's wrong and who just happens to be one of the famous Holdra brothers who forged both Thor's hammer and the axe Kratos is currently wielding. A ludicrous coincidence. Everything about Brock's introduction is really silly, which reflects he and his brother Sindri's original role in the story. Originally, they were here to serve as comic relief. Characters like Brock and Sindri are here to add some desperately needed humor and levity to an otherwise dreary setting, and their familial relationship was meant to serve as a kind of foil to Kratos and Atreus' relationship. Brock only possesses one half of he and his brother's signature smithing brand here at the start of the story, symbolic of the break in their relationship. These two halves will of course be reforged into a single brand when the two brothers forgive each other and restore their old relationship later in the game. This story arc is important to Kratos' story, because Brock and Sindri demonstrate that, in this world, family can always be reunited again, no matter how deep the rift. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's look more at how Brock's character is being portrayed in this very first scene. He is blunt, he is gruff, he curses like a sailor, he says exactly what is on his mind. There is no artifice to Brock, no performance. What you see is what you get. He tells you exactly what he's feeling, he doesn't care what anyone thinks about him. There is a very casual confidence to his character, especially when contrasted with Sindri. Sindri is so nervous all the time, but Brock is the opposite. He seems like he would never be phased by any situation, no matter how bizarre. Like, just look how little reaction he has to meeting Kratos and Atreus out here in a world full of monsters and murderers and evil gods. Kratos and Atreus could be dangerous, and he's not anxious about them in the slightest. And that is confidence. Brock is confident in his abilities, confident in his knowledge, confident in who he is as a person. He does not have anything to prove to anybody. He is supremely talented, the best of the best, and he knows it. And I think it's also evidence of a talent for accurately judging the characters of those he meets. He can tell what kind of person you are after only a short meeting, and I think he quickly judges that Kratos and Atreus are alright, just as he will eventually judge that fake tear is very much not alright. Finally, Brock is a deeply generous character. 
without being asked, without any prompting at all, without even requesting anything in return, he offers to upgrade the Leviathan Axe something he will continue to do throughout both games. Moving on, there's just one more short scene in God of War 4 that I want to watch. Here it is. What? Hey! You reek of foreign magic! Sweden ain't his nethers. What are those? I've never seen the like. That's gotta be a family heirloom. No. Nor will it ever be. Son. My brother and me created me all near for the big idiot. I know from quality. And them? Them special. Hey, where's the little turd? He has fallen ill. No. What happened? Aesir? No. The fault is mine. And my responsibility to make it right. Now, we all got to take responsibility sometime, huh? Say, what can I do to help him? I can do things. What I should tag along? No. Your work here is enough. All right. This is actually one of my favorite scenes in the entire game, and it's not one I see people discuss very often. There are two things I want to talk about here. First is Brock's excitement over seeing the Blades of Chaos. It is interesting that the only character in the game who expresses any enthusiasm at all over the reappearance of this iconic weapon is Brock. But of course he does. He has a genuine love for the art of smithing. Just look how hyped up he is. This might be the most genuinely excited any character gets about anything in this whole series. Brock is a true artist, which I particularly like because he doesn't match the stereotype of how artists are usually portrayed in fiction. He is not moody, he isn't aloof, he isn't egotistical, he is not pretentious, but he is passionate and he does have a keen eye for beauty, even in places where others cannot see it. I also absolutely love Brock's reaction to the news that Atreus is sick. The way the voice actor delivers that, no. Oh, is both hilarious to me and really touching. He sounds so genuinely bummed out about it. I also love how earnest Brock is in this scene. He really wants to help. If that kid is sick, Brock wants to do something about it. He's just a really good guy. Brock is such a likable character. I wasn't a huge fan of him in my first playthrough because his introduction seemed so random and nonsensical. But the more I've replayed these games, the more he's become one of my favorites. Finally, notice how Brock and Kratos share a genuine emotional connection in this scene. I had thought that they didn't really share any connection until that Lady of the Forge scene in Ragnarok, but that is not true. They first make a connection right here. This is the moment where they become friends. This is the foundation of their relationship. That line, what you do here is enough, is delivered in such a tender tone. I honestly think this is probably one of the nicest things Kratos has ever said to anyone. It is all around just a super sweet scene. And more than that, it's important, because this surprisingly intimate relationship between Kratos and Brock is going to continue to be developed in the sequel. Okay, so that's all we're going to look at of Brock's story back in God of War 4, which was relatively simple. But in Ragnarok, his character and story are expanded in a really big way. And we're going to examine exactly how the writers expanded his story by watching a couple cutscenes from that game too. Here's the first one. How'd that get in here? What the hell is it anyway? That is my son. Well, what in all yarns me the happen to him? He's too damn tall now. And he looks like that. I blame you. Well, come on then. Let's get him something that fits at least. All right, let's gear you fuckers up before you go off gallivant. Do you know this? Mmm. Busted up good. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather I just whip you up a new one? It is important to me. Well, I'll see what I can do. 
This is the continuation of Brock and Kratos' relationship. I think it's really notable that Kratos trusts Brock with the broken guardian shield. That shield was a gift from his late wife. It's a huge understatement when Kratos says that it's important to him. As one of the only gifts from his wife he still possesses, it is really, really, really important to him. He would not hand that over to just anybody. And I also think it's notable that Kratos gives it to Brock and not Sindri. I mean, they're both equally capable as smiths, either of them could have done it. But there is a very subtle intimacy between these two characters. I think Kratos really does like and respect Brock both as a blacksmith and as a person. Brock has become a member of the family. In this scene, Brock is written like a sort of funny uncle. Silly, good-natured, cares about his nephew. This shows how the theme of family has been expanded in Ragnarok. Back in God of War 4, family really just meant these little individual units. Kratos and Atreus, Freya and Baldur, Brock and Sindri. But in Ragnarok, all of these characters feel like they are part of one big family. But Brock is also a lot more than that too. I want to skip ahead to Kratos and Freya's journey through Vanaheim, and we're going to watch one very short scene there together. Here it is. What is it you want? I refuse to remain bound to this realm. We travel to Vanaheim. Well, guess it's just us then. <sighs> One gateway to Vanaheim coming right up. This little scene is delightful. The way the camera pans down to reveal that Brock is here too and wearing that stupid hat is hilarious. But I was also really confused the first time I played the game. Like, what is Brock doing here? At first, his conclusion in this part of the story feels so random. This journey through Vanaheim is all about Kratos and Freya's relationship, which is a very emotionally complicated and fraught one. This story could end with her killing him or him ultimately killing her in self-defense. And both possibilities would be tragic. And it has absolutely nothing to do with Brock. So again, what the heck is he doing here? Well, I would like to think that Brock is worried about Kratos and wants to keep an eye on him. He says that he's just going along to meet a friend, and I'm sure that's true too. But maybe he also doesn't want to leave Kratos alone with Freya until he is certain that she's not going to try to hurt him. Maybe Brock wants to protect someone he cares about. Brock also wants to help. He is earnest and honest. We've seen it multiple times already. When people are in trouble, are hurting, Brock always tries to help in any way he can. Brock knows that both Freya and Kratos need help here. Their relationship is totally broken. Her relationship with her brother is totally broken too. They need someone to help break the ice. They need someone to nudge them both in the right direction. We're going to watch just a tiny little bit of that nudging together. Here it is. Listen, I know how bad it can get with one's own kin. Sindri and I were on the out so long, it was like not having a brother at all. Now nah, I take some of the fall for that on account of me walking out. But it never stopped me blaming him most. Any of this sound familiar so far? And what is your point? My point is, that weren't the end all of things after all. Once we got our heads right, it was like no time had passed. He went straight back to being as big a pain in my ass as he ever was. That's family. You gotta keep them close, or they make you good and crazy. Why do you think I need to hear any of this right now? My focus is on regaining my freedom, and I have no intention of being distracted. Look, all I'm saying is, if you happen to find yourself talking to your brother, Maybe the worst words said between you don't have to be the last one said. Enough. When the day comes to face Freya again, it will be when I am standing on my feet and free. Do you understand me? It will not be while I'm stuck in this preposterous situation. Got a case of pride, I get it. Hope yours clears up quicker than mine did. 
It is actually Brock who first pushes Freya towards healing the rift between her and Freyr, for no reason other than that Brock is just a really good guy who wants the people around him to be safe and happy. What we're also seeing here is another example of Brock being a really good judge of people. He never says anything to her about her relationship with Kratos, because he knows the relationship she really needs to fix is the one with her brother. That's the real festering wound. That's the one that's been eating away at her for years and years. Brock's ability to judge others, to cut through the BS, to get at what people really need, is exactly what ultimately allows him to cut through Odin's disguise later. But before we talk about that scene, we need to discuss Kratos and Brock's journey to meet the Lady of the Forge, to craft the Drop Near Spear, the last time they will spend any significant amount of time together. Okay, so just a quick recap. The Norns have just informed Kratos that Heimdall is planning to kill his son. So Kratos decides to kill Heimdall first, but in order to do that, he needs a special weapon. So he asks Brock and Sindri for help. And it is actually Brock who comes up with the idea for the Dropnir Spear. And it is Brock who gives away Dropnir, a magical treasure. A golden ring which infinitely produces perfect copies of itself. Sindri actually has to be convinced to give it up. Brock is willing to give it away to his friends immediately. In order to craft this new weapon, they will have to visit a figure known as the Lady of the Forge, a mermaid with magical crafting abilities. Sindri says he has to be the one to go. Basically, if Brock goes, he's going to discover that he's missing a part of his soul because he died once, and then Sindri brought him back to life, but missing a piece of his soul, like I said, it's complicated. What's important to this analysis is that it is Kratos who chooses Brock, which is a continuation of that subtle intimacy and friendship we've seen developing between these two characters. There's this moment when Kratos says, I like him, he speaks plain which is really a distillation of this entire essay. That is Brock's entire character in three words. He speaks plain. At his core, he is honest, which is something Kratos admires and appreciates. Next, let's watch a very important but short interaction between Kratos and Brock during this journey. Here it is. Ooh, that's brisk. Think I'll grab some for the lady. Grab some what? The wind? No, you idiot. The sound of the wind. Oh, watch and learn. See, dwarven magic's all about the intangibles. The relationship between the stuff what you can touch and what you can't. It's about understanding. Understanding what? The nature of a thing's more important than the form of a thing. Hmm. It is crazy to me that the developers chose not to make this interaction its own full cutscene, because it is such an important moment in the story. In this interaction, Brock defines the entire story of God of War Ragnarok. This is a story about nature, about the difference between a thing's form, its outward appearance, and its true nature, its essence. This is a story about who Kratos really is. It's a story about who Atreus really is, who Freya really is, who Thor really is, who Odin really is. Not the versions of themselves they present to the world, but who they really are deep down inside. Brock is a character who understands nature and essence, and I think that's because he is an artist. And in fiction, artists are often characters who are depicted as being able to see past form, to see the beauty or the monster underneath. And that's what art really is, a search for truth. Whether through writing, painting, composing, or whatever, artists are searching for something that feels true. There is an interaction later where Brock discusses his past as an artist. He says that he used to rush to work as fast as possible so he could prove to everyone else that he was the best. But later in life, he learned to slow down because art is not about being the best. Art is about getting it right, no matter how long it takes to find that truth. I think this is the real answer to that question I posed at the start of this essay. Why Brock? Why Brock instead of any of the other characters? Because Brock is an artist among warriors, and it is in his nature to seek the truth. 
Brock's next big scene in the game is when he encounters the Lady of the Forge, when he learns the truth that he died once, that Sindri, the person who he is closer to than anyone else in the world, has been lying to him for years, that he is in some ways incomplete, that part of his soul is missing. This is still my favorite scene in the game, and I still tear up every single time I watch it, no matter how many times I've seen it, but we're not going to watch the whole thing together in this video, because I've already watched and discussed it in detail in my second Kratos essay. Instead, I'm I'm going to focus on something specific here that I have not discussed in other videos. I want to talk about that blessing Brock gives the drop near Spear, because I find that to be super interesting and very revealing of his character. First, let's watch that blessing together. Here it is. It needs a blessing. Yeah, well, the one to give us the blessing just fucked off into the tomb. It needs the blessing of a great blacksmith. What? No, no, I can't bless shit. I don't have all my soul bits. It, the blessing wouldn't mean squat. It is the nature of a thing that matters, not its form. All right. May this weapon strike true. May it be wielded with wisdom. May it be put down when its job is done. This is just a beautiful scene. The writing and performances here are both perfect. I cannot get enough of what a fantastic job everyone involved in this did. But enough gushing, let's talk about that blessing. This blessing has four parts. The first is, may this weapon strike true. And notice that word he used, strike true, which has a double meaning here. Once again, the focus is on truth, which is the essence of Brock's character. The second part is, may it be wielded with wisdom. This reveals Brock's priorities. He does not care if his weapon is wielded with power, with justice, with combat prowess, does not care about its wielder's capacity for violence, how bloodthirsty they are, how many enemies they can slay with this weapon. He cares about wisdom the wisdom to know when to wield this weapon, and much more importantly, when not to wield it, when to find an alternative to violence. The third part is, may it be put down when its job is done. This is a unique perspective on weaponry. We usually think that weapons are meant to be used, meant for battle, but maybe the true purpose of a weapon is just to win the battle in front of you, so that you can then live in peace. Brock doesn't want his weapons to be wielded forever and ever, to be used in battle after battle, to kill and kill and kill. He wants this spear to help create a world where the spear isn't needed anymore. It is an idealistic and optimistic point of view, and very revealing of a side of Brock's character we haven't seen much of before. The fourth and final part of this blessing is that spit. Brock concludes this blessing by spitting on the spear, which may seem gross and vulgar, but it's just as important as the words he spoke. Because by doing this, he is very literally imbuing the spear with a small piece of himself. Brock is becoming a part of the weapon, imbuing it with his mastery and his honesty. But let's rewind a little bit, back to when Brock learned that he was missing part of his soul. I don't think Brock is really upset about the whole soul thing. I think what he's upset by is the deceit. He has been lied to by his brother, someone he loves and trusts. It hurts to be lied to, but it is also really notable that Brock never confronts Sindri over this lie. And I think there are two reasons for this. First, because Brock and Sindri's relationship has, after years of conflict, finally reached a healthy place, and Brock probably doesn't want to destroy all the progress they've made with a confrontation and argument. And also, I think Brock wants to give
give Sindri the chance to tell the truth himself, to be honest without being forced, and then they can talk it out in an open and productive way. Maybe he really believes that Sindri will tell the truth someday. Of course, Sindri doesn't really get the chance because events outside of their control are quickly going to make that conversation impossible. To end this essay, we need to move on to the end of Brock's life, to his final scenes in the game. Let's watch the scene where he reveals Tyr's true identity now. One last time, I will pick up my spear and I will lead us to Asgard. Excuse me, but if you got a way to Asgard, where's that idea been this whole fucking while? Max! Not that a fair question, brother. You would have held Asgard. You would have gotten us all killed. And we needed to give Loki time to find his destiny. Here it is. It's all led to this. If we can get inside, I'm going after Odin. I will not stop you. We can do both. Spot on, brother. If the mask doesn't give us an out, we'll still have the drop on him. Mm. Works for me. Let's do it then, and quickly, before he sees us coming. He does hate surprises. Slow down, you damn spruce. I still want to hear the details on this uh, new way to Asgard you got. Spill it! It's an ancient path. We can't reach it from here. Where then? Let me collect my things and I'll show you. You ain't got no things. And where are you going with that mask, Brock? That belongs to the kid. He earned it. All you done was make passable dirt soup. Brock, it's okay. No, it ain't. This ain't right. All the pieces ain't welding together true. Like, what's with him calling you Loki anyway? You know that ain't his name. Hey, I'm talking to you. You never shut up. I set this scene up by saying it was the scene where Brock reveals Tyr's true identity, but it's actually a lot more than that. What Brock is really doing here is revealing Odin's true identity. As I said much earlier in the video, killing Brock is the first and perhaps only honest thing that Odin ever does in the entire game. Let me explain what I mean. For the entire game, up until this point, Odin has been putting on a performance. From his first scene, he is pretending to be reasonable, someone you can negotiate with, someone you can have an honest conversation with. He pretends to be someone who cares about peace. He pretends to care about other people, or to not care, depending on the needs of the current situation. He never shows his true self until Brock provokes him into doing so in this scene. So who is Odin? What is his true character? Well, as revealed in this confrontation, Odin is a petty, violent tyrant who does not value human life in the slightest, who will, for any reason or no reason at all, resort to murder, just because he is annoyed and he really only cares about control. What's really important to understand here is that we probably never ever would have seen Odin's true character if not for Brock. Odin's lies and manipulations tricked everyone else. Odin was getting what he wanted. He was just about to get possession of this mask. Kratos was still refusing to participate in the battle for Ragnarok, meaning that it never would have been successful. Everything was, basically, still going according to Odin's plan. And then Brock waltzes into this scene, a character whose essence is truth, who cuts through all the bullshit, who cuts right through Odin's bullshit, easily, instantly, and then Odin kills him. And in that act, he seals his own fate. He loses the mask, he loses his life because it is only after seeing who Odin really is after the cold-blooded murder of a member of his family, a character we've seen him share a close personal connection with, that Kratos finally chooses war. I mean, not at first. He has to take a quick detour, hunting trip through Midgard, but he very quickly gets back on track. And when Kratos chooses war, Odin is screwed. This is what I meant at the beginning of this video when I said that Brock's death is a very productive one. 
it propels other characters forward. It pushes the story to its conclusion. That's why I think it is actually Brock who destroys Odin. Not because Brock literally slays Odin in battle, but because it is Brock's search for the truth that finally untangles Odin's web of lies. And without his deceit, Odin is nothing. Just a sad, frightened old man grasping at power. But Brock's story is not quite done yet. He has one last important act of truth to perform. Here it is. Please, you have to save him. You have to. He can't. You can't. Maybe if I go back to the lake. Stop me. I know what you've done. And I forget you. But you gotta stop. You gotta let go. Bro. Do you remember earlier in this video when we discussed Freya, Kratos, and Brock's journey to Vanaheim, and how it was Brock who first encourages her to reconcile with her brother? Because Brock is a character who can see the truth, see what people really need, and he saw that what Freya really needed was to heal her relationship with Freya. Well, there is something very similar happening here with Brock's last words to Sindri. Brock can see that his brother is a deeply wounded and flawed character. And what Sindri needs is two things, forgiveness and to let go. Brock can see that if Sindri is never able to let go, then he will never be happy. So with his final words, Brock tries to give him that. With his final words, Brock tries to do what he always does, which is to help anyone who needs it. And tragically, Sindri doesn't really get it. He does not let go. I already made a video about Sindri once, over a year ago now, but as I was writing this essay about Brock and re-examining all of these scenes, I realized how much I missed in that video. There's so much more going on with Sindri's character than I covered there. He is much more complicated than he appears on the surface. So for for my next God of War essay, whenever that will be, and it will probably be a while, I'm going to return to Sindri's character and do a deeper dive into his flaws and his tragic inability to let go. But first, we need to conclude this essay. After multiple playthroughs, Brock has become one of my favorite characters in this series. He is so defined by his honesty and by his desire to help others, but also by his artistry. You might think that Sindri is more of an artist than Brock, because Sindri is fancier and more finicky, and he wears this much more elaborate armor. But as Brock himself says, it's not about a thing's form, but its nature. Art is not about what you can see on the surface, but about what you can find when you dig down deep inside. Even though he has a much more gruff and blunt and unwashed appearance, I think Brock is actually the truer artist. And that kind of reflects the themes of both of these Norse mythology games. God of War was a series with a gruff, blunt, and unwashed appearance. They were great action games, violent, exciting, cinematic, but were not necessarily known for their stories. But the developers looked past that surface, dug down deep into Kratos' character, and found there a really meaningful story. In this way, Brock can be seen as a sort of symbol for the entire God of War series. A bit ugly and dirty and vulgar on the outside, but underneath, at its essence, artistic, thoughtful, honest, and true. That is the meaning of art, and the meaning of Brock's character. 